Thanks for Pastor Mark for being willing to give up his pulpit for a Sunday. As a, you know, as a pastor, I know that can be, that can be challenging uh, to, to give up your pulpit, but um, have an opportunity to, to speak about the sanctity of human life. And today we're going to be talking about some tough topics, um, but I know, I know that God is in and through our thoughts, and uh, he'll be with us as we, as we worship him and, and look into the word this morning. So uh, that'll, be, that'll be great. So first, let me, let me bring you up to date on, on options for women. Uh, you know, I'm the head of the organization, and, and we try to meet the needs of women and families that are um, in what we call unplanned pregnancies. You know, a couple of decades ago, we might have called them unwed mothers and sent them off to um, institutions to have their babies and tried to hide them from society. We don't do that anymore. Um, and Options for Women is there to, to help them so they don't feel abandoned. They don't feel left, left out of society. They don't feel uh, pushed out of the culture and out of their families and, and out of all our way of life. Uh, we want them to understand how much, even if they've made a bad choice, that we love them, that this culture loves them, that the world loves them. Uh, they have a place in our world and, uh, and we want their babies to live. So we, we recognize that they are dear children of God. They are carrying the children of God. And Options for Women is there to, to help them to, to find that. We do that through a lot of different ways. Uh, but we, we try to provide the help that women need when they're in a rough place. Um, a lot of folks that come to us uh, for our services, whether it's you know pregnancy verification or counseling or ultrasounds or maternity clothing or whatever it is that, that uh, they're in need of, um, we hope that we can help them to see how much God loves them, how much God sees them and their baby and loves, loves both of them, um, and try to help them to make a choice not to terminate the life of the child. So thank you for your support. We know a number of you have filled, in, uh, filled up baby bottles, and we've got a few in the back. We'll, we'll take those in and put those to work this week. We know that there are others that will probably still be coming in over the next weeks, and, and we, we thank you for those, and, and we're, we're very grateful for, for that. Uh, you know, in New Jersey, if you follow politics and, and things like that, you know that our legislature and our governor have just made a choice to allow women to terminate the life of their child up until the baby's due date. It's really tragic. And in New Jersey, now, under this new law, you can also have an abortion provided for you by a, a person who is not a doctor. If you can imagine that. You know, doctors, with all their training, can spend a decade or more preparing to, to be a physician Sadly, some of them choose to become abortionists. But in New Jersey now, beyond physicians being able to do this, you can go to an advanced practice nurse or a physician's assistant or even a nurse midwife to perform an abortion for you in the first trimester. So we're working actively to, to try to uh, you know, see how God might use options to help more and more and more women. And it's your support, it's really your help that really makes a difference for us. So 2021 was uh, quite a year, and I think I've had a chance to share with a lot of you what's been, what's been going on in our ministry. On February 1st, uh, we were pleased to open a center in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, if you've ever been to Trenton, um, spend any time there, you know that in the downtown area where the legislature meets, where the, the state house is and the governor's office, it's not bad. It looks kind of nice. But if you go a couple of blocks out from that into the out, what they call the outer ring of Trenton, it's desperately poor, horrifically poor, um, and with a lot of folks that are, you know, we'll call them you know, um, undocumented folks who, who live in Trenton who are sort of outside of the mainstream and unable to get lots of services and care. So we opened our doors in, uh, in Trenton on the, the 1st of February. We're just a few blocks down the street from the from the Capitol building. So we're in a great place. We're right next to the biggest high school in Trenton. Uh, we're re really excited about uh, the number of clients that are coming to us. We had 11 ultrasounds there in January. So that's, um, that's really exciting. Also on February 1st, um, because of some things that we've been doing in the background, um, we decided to acquire two more centers down at the Jersey Shore One's in Ocean City, and one's in North Cape May. Um, they were struggling. 
their board had sort of fell, fallen out of love with, with the work and had been struggling. They'd been doing it for a long time, like 30 years. And um, God just spoke to them and us about us taking over their ministry. And um, so we, we've been working on it. We've been upgrading our staff there. We've been, been challenging the volunteers and training them and, and helping them to, to get it back to the, vol- uh, to the vibrant ministry that it, it once was. It has a very vibrant history there in Ocean City and North Cape May. So we've been working hard to do that. So God's been doing a lot, and we're, we're excited. The last thing uh, that I think is the most exciting, and I, we had it here just a few weeks ago, our mobile medical unit has arrived, and we're, we're close to being able to get it on the road. Just a couple little steps before we can get it out there. But um, anything that we can do in the office, we'll be able to do on our mobile medical unit. We have the, do we have the slides up, Becky? No? Okay. Um, there's a picture of this in the slides, but apparently they're not working. So um, it is uh, a, a, a beautiful thing, uh, almost a quarter million dollars to get this thing built and, and available for us. You know how much it costs options for women? Zip. Not a penny. So an organization in Colorado Springs provided the, about 80% of a generous donor provided the rest, and we're ready to get this thing out on the road. So we know that God's going to utilize it for his glory and for serving um, families, um, women and, and men, uh, all throughout central and southern New Jersey. We're real excited. And it's because of you and your help, your financial gifts, um, your support of, of us through you know, the provision of you know, clothing for the babies and diapers, and, and uh, we are just so grateful for all the ways that you've helped us to, to yeah, get where we are. Uh, the exciting thing is we know that God's not finished. There's more. We just don't know yet what it is, uh, but God is, God is doing so much. So thank you for your support and your prayers. Uh, we can only do this sort of thing with your help. So we, we are just you know, prayerfully considering you know, what God would do in the future and seeing how he's going to work and just grateful that uh, you're supporting us and, and really, really appreciate it so much. Why don't we take a minute to pray, and then we'll uh, get into God's Word this morning. Father, we thank you for our time together, and we do think about life today. It's been cheapened and pushed to the side in so many ways, and, but we know that your desire is to, is to give life to every child that's conceived and to, to provide life for everyone until their natural death. We thank you, Father, for all the ways that life is considered by, by people who are of faith. The, different way, the many different ways that we can and look at uh, providing a, a pro-life view of our, the lives around us, whether it is uh, a young person, an unborn child, a, a born child, maybe even a person in a nursing home who's not, not being cared for well. Th- these are all pro-life things, Father, and we just pray that you'll use us to look around our world and see how we can support those around us who are in need. We just thank you that, that you love life and you have created us to be like you, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing how you continue to reveal yourself to us and, and how we can support and love those around us. Thank you for our time together. Be with us as we look into your word, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, who's thankful to be alive this morning? Anybody know? (laughs) We'll talk. (laughs) Isn't it great to be able to, I don't know, breathe? (laughs) You know, wake up every morning and kind of go, okay, I got another day. (laughs) You know, uh, and then, you know, the things that we do, like eat, uh, there's a famous line from a movie, I forget what the movie's called, but it's just, you know, I'm just here for the food, <laughs> you know? But we're able, to, we're able to eat and enjoy things. We can laugh and play and we can relax and work and we can worship. You know, to be able to live, you know, have life every day is, uh, it's a wonderful gift, isn't it? Isn't it great to be able to go and watch a beautiful sunset? You know, I, I every once in a while, um, I'll be in my wife's home office, and when I get home, like five o'clock ish, I'll look out the window toward the sunset, and it'll be violets and purples and pinks and orange and just amazing, amazing view. 
She gets to work at home. I don't. <clears throat> but, you know. <laughs> but beautiful sunsets are a great thing. We, we love seeing them down at the shore as well. Um, isn't it great to be able to, you know, eat your favorite dessert? Who's got a favorite dessert? Anybody want to tell us what their favorite dessert is? Ice cream. Yeah. It, anything chocolate, you know, it's all good. So, um, and then there are other things. You know, you should go shopping, go to a, an athletic event with your children, or, or, you know, just go to, you know, watch something fun like a, a dance recital. Or maybe you like to go fishing. Who likes to go fishing here? <laughs> yeah. But isn't it wonderful to know, you know, that God is in so many of these activities and we can enjoy our lives. Uh, we can go for a walk on the beach. We can walk through the woods. We can stroll through our neighborhood or walk through a mall. Anybody been to a mall lately? I try to avoid that as much as possible. But isn't it wonderful to be able to see the grandeur of life? You know, the, and God's creation around us, uh, the beauty of, of a rose. Or, hey, how about the, the stained glass windows right here in this room uh, that point us to how much God loves us and, and the stories of, that we see in, in Scripture. Isn't it wonderful to be alive today? Well, you know, every year in the United States, almost one billion children are not given the opportunity to enjoy the things that we just talked about. They're not given life. That's how many abortions take place just in America every year, just under a million. That amounts to about 3,000 every day. Three every minute, one every 20 seconds. In New Jersey, over 50,000 babies' lives were taken last year. That's, a, that's the number that we know about. We don't know about the number of women who took what's called the abortion pill and had their, the life of their baby terminated at home. Did you know that in Cherry Hill, not far from here, we're right off King's Highway here, and right off King's Highway in Cherry Hill, there's a place called the Cherry Hill Women's Center. It's just north of Chapel Avenue on the left-hand side. One-fifth of all the abortions in New Jersey are performed there every year. That's 10,000 abortions in Cherry Hill. So what does God have in mind when we think about these kinds of things? What does, what does God want us to know? Um, what kind of truth would he have us to understand when we think about this terrible holocaust that's taking place literally in our neighborhood? Well, he would tell us, first of all, that he is the creator of life, isn't he? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, And then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. How many people like creeping things? alligators <laughs> snakes how about millipedes i mean i mean we're, we're talking some really gross stuff but he gave us dominion over the birds and the sea and the fish and the livestock and over all the earth even the things that creep on the earth you know i remember when i was a kid my sunday school teachers and i went to church not too far from here my church just about every respected person in my life taught taught me that I was created by God. Isn't that great? To know that, you know, even though it was the union of my parents, it was God who fashioned me in my, in my mother's womb, whose idea it was, and whose process it was, and whose thought it was even before there was time. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe that you were created by God and made by God for, in His image? I do, and I know that there's a biological process is necessary for a child to be conceived, but we know that God is the creator, is the essence of life. Every precious life that you see around you is created by God, every single one. Even that guy on Twitter who disagrees with you every day, even that person at work who's just obnoxious 
and makes your life crazy. Maybe that neighbor down the street who plays music until late in the night or shoots off fireworks at 2 o'clock in the morning on New Year's Eve. That's the one I really disagree with. They're all created by God. They're all His. You know, at some point in this world, we got so sophisticated that we, we thought we could move away from this foundational truth that God made us, that we are His idea, that we are His, his thoughts, and we determined that even though God is the creator of life, we could be the ones who could take innocent lives. When did that happen? Well, it goes back a bit, and we'll talk about that. But just as another reminder, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God tells us, And then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Again. We're a creation of God. He is our creator, the, the lover of our souls. But not only does God create life, he breathes his breath of life into us. How many of you have been present when a, a baby is born and, and you, you kind of wait and then all of a sudden the baby goes, <gasps> and then starts crying. <laughs> you know, like, excuse me, I was nice and warm and cozy and you took me out into this world. But that first breath, that's the breath that God gives into every human being. It's he that gives life. He gave life to every precious person, every person you see in those around you. Whether you like them or not, God created them, and he is the giver of life. Let me tell you a story about a, a doctor who learned an important lesson. His name was Bernard Nathanson. And in the 1970s, right after Roe versus Wade was, was uh, approved by the Supreme Court, he became essentially the leading abortion doctor in the United States. He had campaigned vigorously for the, for the legalization of abortion. You know, it, it, it hasn't always been legal. Prior to January 1973, it was very hard to get an abortion in America. But after Roe versus Wade was approved, it became a little simpler. In his lifetime as a physician, he performed 60,000 abortions. Think about that. That's Haddon Heights six times over. He even believed that his intentions were good and that he was doing a righteous thing by providing a service that guaranteed a woman's right to have control over her own body. But something changed for Dr. Nathanson one day. It was a medical breakthrough called ultrasound. Anybody have ever seen an ultrasound of a baby? Pretty cool stuff. We have ultrasound machines in two of our offices at Options, and it's the most exciting thing that, that, that I can imagine. When, when, I, when I see a mom go into, the, into the, the exam room where the ultrasound machine is and hear the heartbeat, well, for us, for Dr. Nathanson, the ultrasound machine opened a portal into something he had never th really thought about before. He saw a window into what we call fetal development. He was able to see a baby in the womb. We had never been able to see that before. And the first time Dr. Nathanson saw an ultrasound in action, he was with a group of residents who were gathered around a pregnant patient in a darkened examining room watching a demonstration by a technician who, was, who had brought this new machine into the hospital where they worked. The technician applied what we call a conductive gel. You know, it's that really cold stuff they put on your belly. And, uh, and, and it options, by the way, we have gel warmers, just so you know. <laughs> so it, it's a little thing that warms up the jelly so it's not freezing cold when it hits you. And then she began working the sensor over this mom's uterus and, and belly. As the screen clarified, Dr. Nathanson was amazed, thrilled. He could see a throbbing heart. You can actually see the heart on the ultrasound. You can actually see the, the chambers of the heart as they beat on the ultrasound. When the technician focused closely on the image, Dr. Nathanson could see all the heart's chambers pumping full of blood and moving the blood out into the rest of this baby's body. 
And during that scan, Dr. Nathanson became convicted. He said that his mind had dropped the word fetus in favor of the word, what's that thing in the womb? It's a baby. Anybody ever be pregnant and someone comes up and says, oh, how's your fetus? No. How's your baby? It's a baby. And Dr. Dr. Nathanson realized that all of this teaching, all these years of learning and processing and, and doing what he'd been doing, and it changed everything. It changed everything in his mind. Dr. Nathanson, who was a leading abortion doctor in America, became convinced that human life existed within the womb from the onset of pregnancy, from the moment of conception. In an article he wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine, he said, the New England Journal is the second most widely cited medical journal in the world, so it's pretty important that he wrote this article there. He said, in an abortion, we take a human life. And doctors around the world were scandalized because every doctor reads the New England Journal of Medicine. But he said, the fetus is not mere tissue, it's a human life. And this article changed everything. It changed everything. So let's go back to Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, And then so God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. You know, there's a lot right there, isn't there? Male and female, first of all. Just two. But man was created in God's own image. Every precious life, the one that Dr. Bur Dr. Nathan saw in 1976 on that ultrasound image on that, in that machine, every baby that's been conceived since then, everyone is created in the image of God. You and I are created in the image of God. Now, physically, no, God doesn't look like us. Or we don't look physically like, you know, like God. We don't know what he looks like. But our character, our souls, our spirits are all God. It's the nature of God that we are created in. So that doesn't mean, though, that even though we're created in the, the image of God, that we will be God, does it? There, there are times when somebody in my family has to remind me that I'm not God, that there's only one of those. Not mentioning any names, honey, are we? <laughs> there's only one God, and it's not me. And I'm not really in charge, even though I think I'm in charge. But God created us in his image to be like him, not to be him, but to be like him. So what does it mean if we have the capacity to think intelligently, to feel emotions and, and to reason? It's not a process that has come about by evolution. You know, this whole thing of the way we're, we're created and, and born isn't just some evolutionary thing, but it's a God-given part of every human being's life. John MacArthur is a, a great pastor and writer. He heads up a seminary. He's a pastor of a large church. Um, he's a, just a wonderful teacher. He wrote this phrase, the image of God, defined man's unique relation to God and set him apart from the animals. He was like God in that he could reason and had intellect and will and emotion. But you know, if you go back to the book of Genesis, in the first five days, God created all the stuff. You know, the rocks, the trees, the birds, the animals. And what did he say that they were? They were good. On the sixth day, he made us. He created humankind. And when he sat back and thought about what he'd done, what did he say it was? It was very good. That's what he said. It's in Scripture. So if we're very good and God loves us that much and we are his creation, how did we come to a place in our society where we destroy the lives of of millions of babies around the world every year. You know, I said we, we take about a million lives here in the United States every year. 
Imagine how many are taken around the world in an even greater context. How have we gotten to the point where precious God-created, God-given image of God life is destroyed so easily, so cavalierly? Well, if we go to Scripture again, King Solomon gives us a pretty good idea of how this happened. It's in the book of 1 Kings, and the Lord there loved Solomon. He loved Solomon. He was a great king. He loved him dearly. And Solomon, well, he tried all his ways to please the Lord. He really did. If you, if you um, and it, he did so much that in 1 Kings ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, God told Solomon, ask what I shall give you. He said, Basically, what do you want? You have done everything I've asked. You've lived the way I want you to live. Just ask, and I'll give it to you. You know what he requested? A BMW. A new, no. He requested wisdom and knowledge, which God gave him. But God also did the, you know, the equivalent of the BMW and the house on the beach. He gave him riches and honor along with his wisdom. But God placed a condition on Solomon, and he said, if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Wow, that's a promise. How many of us know if God has promised us tomorrow? We don't. But if God made a promise to Solomon, like, if you obey me and love me and keep my commandments, I'll lengthen your days. That's a pretty cool promise. You know, I'd like to live long enough to see more grandchildren. <coughs> no, I have other children beside Rob and Jess. <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to see the beach more, you know? I'd actually like to, I don't know, retire someday and, and enjoy traveling and, and doing things. But I don't know if God has promised me tomorrow. But he promised Solomon that he would lengthen his days if he would be good. If he would walk in the ways of God and obey him for a long time. And Solomon did. And in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 and 31, he tells us that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight. And the breadth of understanding is measureless as the sand on the seashore. He was wiser than any other man. Wow. Must have been pretty cool to be Solomon. Have knowledge and wisdom and riches and honor from God. I can only imagine. The first 10 chapters of 1 Kings tell us of the incredible wisdom and the exploits of King Solomon as he walked with God and he enjoyed his blessings. He finished building the temple of God and he ruled his people with justice and wisdom. And then we come to 1 Kings chapter 11. And in verse 1, there's a word. However. It's a modifier. It qualifies whatever has gone on before. It changes this great report of 10 chapters about wisdom and knowledge and Solomon's greatness before God into a bad report. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1 says, King Solomon, however loved many foreign women. You see, God had specifically told the Israelites, he gave them an order, he said, you must not intermarry with them, people who are not Israelites, because they will surely turn your hearts against your God. They will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And verse 2 goes on to say, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Oops. Then verses 3 to 6 go on to tell of this downward spiral of his life and his love for God. Let me read this for you. Now so King Solomon loved many foreign women. Anybody know how many? Oh, we'll, we'll get there. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. 
Solomon clung to these in love. He had, get this, 700 wives. Can I be honest? One, for me, is plenty. (laughs) I love her with all my heart. I can't imagine two, or five, or 700. He had 700 wives who were princesses, and 300 concubines. These were women he, he was not married to, but he still was in a relationship with. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Molech the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And Solomon turned from the one true living God to the worship of Ashtoreth and Molech. Ever heard those names before? Maybe a little if you've read through the book of 1 Kings, but there's not a whole, we don't talk about these things in history much. Ashtoreth was the goddess of sensual living. She was the goddess of fertility and reproduction. So he, he turned away from the living God to the goddess of sensual living, the goddess of fertility and reproduction. And Molech was a pagan god to whom child sacrifices were made. Imagine. Sound familiar? Our whole society has turned away from its total devotion to God and has turned his heart to pursue these same gods today. They might have different names, but people everywhere are turning from total devotion to God and are pursuing the spirit of Ashtoreth or sensual living. Look around the world. Watch TV for an hour. You'll see it everywhere. There's almost nothing on on television that you can watch where you don't have to fast forward every couple of minutes because there's language or something else that we shouldn't be watching. We live in a world where we're we're devoted to the spirit of Ashtoreth Ashtoreth and this kind of sensuality. sensuality. We have a desperate housewives, bachelor and bachelorette sort of mindset out in the world. Tells us we can do anything we want. Anything that makes us feel good, anything that our depraved minds and our hearts can come up with. If we want to have sex before marriage, if we want to have sex outside of marriage, if we want to have sex with someone we don't even truly love, or maybe someone that we don't even know that well, go ahead. It's just fine. The spirit of Ashtoreth says it's okay. And then in the spirit of Molech, if you do end up getting pregnant or getting someone pregnant, then you simply go and see your obliging obstetrician gynecologist who will help you to sacrifice that inconvenient child in any number of ways, all the way up to that last month of of pregnancy. That's where we are today. We think, oh, that was Solomon. He was a bad guy and he worshiped those guys. Aren't we as a culture doing the same thing? As a society. We even have Christian denominations today whose statements of belief support abortion. I was reading just this week where where pastors from a number of different denominations went in front of a Planned Parenthood and offered prayers of blessing for what's going on inside their walls. I am so thankful to be part of a church that has gone on record as being totally pro-life. Our pastor has been a a lead for that here for all his time at Joy, and I'm grateful for that. And we're also a part of the Evangelical Free Church of America, which has said, as evangelicals committed to the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death, we need to be prepared to respond to questions 
we receive when asked about our commitment to being pro-life. All of life for the whole life. It is a privilege to be able to speak this truth and to speak on behalf of the weakest and the most vulnerable of humanity. Truly, God is the God of the living, which means our doctrine and our ethic is committed to the same life. Thank you to the leadership of the denomination to which we belong. So what do we do? Understanding what's going on in our culture, in our neighborhoods, maybe, maybe even among those that we love. How do we respond? If every life is precious, what are we to understand today? Pro-life means that you oppose the intentional killing of innocent human beings in the womb. Our case looks like this. Premise number one. Tell me if you agree with this. It is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human life. Agree? Premise number two. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being, which we all just agree was wrong. The conclusion is that abortion is wrong. If we don't, if we agree that killing is wrong and abortion kills a, a life, then abortion is wrong. To be pro-life, then, as believers, means to speak up on behalf of children being led to the slaughter, as Scripture tells us to avoid, and to engage in the rescue of these children and their parents, who are often victims of the big abortion lie. So where do we go? Well, the first thing you need to do is to commit your life to the God of life. If you've never committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, maybe today is the day. Maybe today is the day. No matter what the world and our culture tell you is right, God is ultimately the creator of life, and it, it is to him that we owe everything. It's time maybe to make a commitment with your life about who you belong to. Stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. Renew your devotion to the God of life. All of us have had, you know, those however moments, haven't we? Just like Solomon, moving along just great, loving God, however. It may be that that's where you are right now. You used to walk with God, however. You used to love God with all your heart, however. God warns us against giving in to the however moments. If you've ever, ever given in to a however moment in your life, maybe now is the time back to turn back to the Lord, to give up whatever the however is. If you don't, you'll end up like Solomon who died a broken, disillusioned, and spiritually insensitive guy. Stand up. Live for the God of life. And the wonderful thing about this is that the God of life gives life over and over and over again. Maybe you've had the second chance or the third chance or the fourth chance. Know that God is the God of the 100 chances. Or as you know, he, he told some, the 490 chances, 70 times 7. We need to yield ourselves completely to, to him so that we might live his life through us. We need to always stand up for life, the life of the unborn and those that are already born. Maybe the people working beside you at your job or in school, or at the grocery store, might not be people you'd hang around with, but they are precious lives given by God. They are people loved by God, people for whom Jesus died. They are part of a world in, in need of a Savior, in need of the unconditional love of God that only He can give. They are people who may be suffering from the consequences of abortion. There have been 63 million abortions since 1973, 
How many women in your work, in your school, in your neighborhood, have had an abortion and have never shared that with you, who might be suffering from the guilt and depression and anxiety that it brings? There are people who are suffering from that, and they are in need of the love and the grace that only God can offer, the love and grace that you and I can share with those around us. My brothers and sisters, every life is precious, every unborn life and every born life. You are precious to God. Let's stand up and live for that God today. I hope you'll join me in that. Pastor Mark's going to come up. All right, well, I wanted to pray over Chuck, uh, but real quick, um, you, you might have seen in the news and everything, and even with the uh, march this year, the March for Life this year, it was interesting to see how the media covered it because they, they were saying, you know, well, this may be the last year of the march because, you know, the Supreme Court might rule and say that, that abortion isn't constitutional now and and you know and and they're trying to bait people that were at the march into saying yeah that's right that's what we're here about and really that's not the fight for life the fight for life isn't about laws it's about the hearts and you know what if the supreme court and we hope the supreme court rules and and you know makes makes abortion unconstitutional and makes it illegal and all of that but there were abortions that happened before 1973 mm -hmm. and there will be abortions that happen even after the supreme court rules otherwise so there will be a need for us to fight for life mm -hmm. there will be a need for options <laughs> people like chuck to be on the front lines of that fight because it's about our hearts and remember what we always say only only god can change a heart and that's that's I, I really think that the fight will ramp up if anything if something were to happen with the Supreme Court on our part we need to make sure that that we're doing all the more to celebrate life and protect life so um, you know so it's exciting times but it's also a huge responsibility uh, for us as a church and there's gonna be ways I know Chuck will be sharing with us how we can how we can um, continue to support options but also support this fight for life but we also want to pray for chuck and for options and for all uh that he's doing i mean we don't see him as much on sundays now because he's out speaking at other churches uh about life and and getting more support for that so it's exciting in one way and kind of a bummer in another we don't see him as much but we want to pray for you and we want to pray for options this morning so uh why don't you pray with me definitely father we thank you and i i praise you for my brother here chuck and um as we've gotten to know each other over the years, Lord, I know that's where his heart is. His heart is for life. And not just for the life of the unborn, but the, the life of, uh, that you have created. All in the image of God, Lord. And to protect and to support and to most of all celebrate that life. And it's been, it's been neat to see how you've placed him in this position with options, Lord. And, and, and given him uh, this platform where he can share it and where he can... Uh, help inspire lord your people to stand up for life so lord i pray your anointing on chuck as he not only speaks on sundays but as he serves each and every day at options that you uh, protect him that you give him the words he needs and the and the the support that he needs lord to be able to help lead this and i pray for all the workers and volunteers over at options lord they're on the front lines and because we're on the front lines, face attacks, Lord. So we pray a hedge of protection around options and the offices and all the work, even the, even the van as that goes around, Lord, and um, that, that you place a hedge of protection. But, Lord, we do pray for this fight for life. We pray for our politicians and the Supreme Court, Lord, but it goes beyond that, Lord. Uh, we pray for this fight for life, that our nation can come to realize that life only comes from you and only you can change that and you can change it through our faithfulness as well and through us celebrating it lord we pray for those uh, babes that are unborn right now lord and the moms are facing a choice and we pray that you protect those babies lord and the mothers lord bring support around them that they can uh, make this right choice for life lord and and help us use our resources to help with that and to, and to help promote it, Lord. We also pray for those that have had abortions, Lord, and 
that's something that it may be done cavalierly, but it, it carries with someone their entire life, the guilt and the shame, Lord. And we pray that you heal that, Lord, because you, you, can, you can heal shame. And that you can um, be with them as well, Lord, and we lift them up, Lord. And we lift up those that don't agree and don't fight for life and, and that support abortion and that may not know you, Lord. And we pray that they come to know you as your Lord and Savior. And most of all, Lord, we place before you, Lord, our lives so that we can be in this fight for what you created as very good. And we celebrate you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Mind if I share one more thing? Yep. Um, starting tomorrow morning uh, and for the next 14 weeks, every Monday morning for an hour, I'll be on a Zoom call with pastors in Uganda, Kenya, Sudan, and Pakistan, teaching them how to be pro-life. I'd appreciate your prayers for them.